All right, we'll begin. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, another installment. This is the fourth installment of our Lunch with Eaters uh, event series. We're bringing a lot of great, uh, diverse virtual content to you on these uh, Friday lunch times. And we are really excited for today's program. And I'm, I'm glad to see so many folks who have registered and who have signed in for this event today. Uh, we have this two times a month virtual lunch and learn program built specifically for you, our UCI alumni community. Uh, I am Jeff Menhaas. I'm your host today. I'm the executive director at the UCI Alumni Association. So I am uh, just, just really thrilled with our subject matter today and also our special guest who I'll have the pleasure of introducing shortly. And he has a few special guests of his own which are gonna be draws in and of themselves. Uh, before we get started, I have a few things I wanna go over quickly. Number one, we have a, a really great resource which is new. Uh, it's super useful during this time of social distancing and the pandemic. It's called the Anteaters Go Virtual webpage. Uh, this is a page that has all kinds of resources for you, our alumni, to feel connected and engaged with the university. Everything from our events listing, which has been very busy, We've been doing three to four virtual events every week like this. We also have ways to, to, for you to get involved and pay it forward to future generations of anteaters as a mentor through the Anteater Network Mentor Program, which is awesome. Uh, we even have fun things like downloadable uh, color pages for your family and kids and uh, uh, lots of uh, intellectual content that our academic units at, at UCI are putting out at the same time. So. Check out that Anteaters Go Virtual page. We'll have a link to that on the last slide for today, and it's on the Alumni Association website. Uh, you're all muted today in order to eliminate background noise and interference. However, this is definitely designed to be interactive. So we encourage you to submit questions uh, via the Q&A and chat features on Zoom. Uh, we're gonna have a program uh, in which our main speaker, Ethan, is gonna give you a lot of information, and then we're gonna come back around to an audience Q&A. So if any questions you have pop up, feel free to get those in, we encourage that. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, kind of move things forward and invite our guest to join us. I have the pleasure of introducing Ethan Fisher, class of 2005. Ethan, uh, he graduated one year after I did, class of 04, but Ethan has over 15 years of experience working in the zoo and aquarium industry. He enjoys discovering novel solutions and approaches to projects and problems, and his experience every day at the Santa Ana Zoo brings new challenges and even greater rewards. Ethan is the director of our uh, wonderfully local Santa Ana Zoo, and he's gonna give us a lot of information today. So. Uh, please join me, although you're muted, please join me in giving uh, Ethan a big anteater welcome. So, thank you for, uh, for joining me today. I mean, it's great that the, the Alumni Association has been able to put this um, speaker series together for, for our Friday luncheons. Um, super excited to be here and talk to you about the zoo, talk to you about the anteaters, and then also hear your questions and then um, try to, to spread some anteater, anteater knowledge. Um, I know we're gonna be going into our first poll question, so um, I think we're gonna do that right now. Yes, uh, so okay. uh, a poll's gonna pop up on your screen right now. Where is the taxidermied anteater <laughs> named Mermy located at UCI? We'll give you about uh, 20 seconds to, to submit your answer and we'll see who's correct. And if you didn't know, yes, there is and has been an <laughs> anteater on campus for many, many, many years, even through all the different uh, phases of student center construction. Oh, I might have just given away the answer there. Let's see our poll oh, no. results. Oh <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the vast majority got it correct. 30, uh, 60% did say it's in the student centers. So the bottom of the stairs near the courtyard study lounge, our anteater named Mermy. So Ethan, <laughs> uh, please take it away, sir. Okay, well, um, yeah, so there is, a, there is an anteater that, that is at UCI. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't say it's living at UCI because it's taxidermied, but um, 
that was probably one of the first anteaters I've ever seen in, in person. Um, when, you, when you see, unless you at UCI seeing a sculpture, um, the bronze sculpture that's outside of the Brand Event Center or, or seen that one, you really don't realize how massive anteaters are. They are, they're big creatures, almost 130 pounds. And we'll definitely um, be taking a look at Peter and his family and then talking about um, the anteaters a little bit later on in the natural history of anteaters. Um, but I'll give you some more information on myself. So my name is Ethan Fisher. I grew up in Orange County um, and I always was around wildlife and nature. And that, um, that's sort of how I ended up on the career path that I went on and going to work at the zoo, going and getting a biology degree at UC Irvine. Um, that the, the UCI school is, it's just a really beautiful campus um, with, the, with the Ring Road in Aldrich Park. And it's just um, a great place that we just happen to have so local. So that, that was one thing that definitely drew me to the school. Um, prior, to, prior to starting at UCI, I was already working at the zoo because I started as a volunteer when I was in high school. Um, so it, it sort of happenstance in some ways that I am still here. Um, and also definitely my interest in animals and nature and, and, and plants. Um, so going to, going to UCI, I, I was working at the zoo. Uh, my first job here was as a um, zoo camp instructor. I was volunteering in the education department, um, teaching, teaching lots of classes, doing presentations. Um, and then I was offered a position as a zoo camp instructor. And I worked all summer with, um, I started with the junior zoo campers. So I worked with the six year olds, the six and seven year olds. And we did crafts and activities and we sung songs. And uh, it, was, it was just a lot of fun. And I continued to do that for, for all my summers that I was at UCI. Uh, and eventually I graduated to instructing the older kids. So I moved up from the six-year-olds to the 10-year-olds. Um, and all the while that I was teaching the kids at the zoo, um, I also had some memories of myself because I attended zoo camp myself. I also attended um, the camp at the Ocean Institute in Dana Point. So I've always had uh, a love for the ocean and for fish and, and aquatic creatures. Um, and there, one of the things that was, was a great memory for me from UCI was actually taking the aquatic biology and limnology class. Um, because when, when I was in the biology program, you of course had to take your core classes. I discovered I wasn't a, I wasn't a big fan of microbiology and biochemistry. Sorry if that's you. <laughs> um, but I, I really did move towards ecology and the, the restoration biology and, and then the aquatic, uh, aquatic biology classes where we went and looked at the freshwater streams. Um, we went into Laguna Canyon and we did some studies there. Um, also, we went into the marsh next to UCI. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Bowler is still teaching at UCI, but he was the instructor at the time. And the, the biggest memory I have from that class that uh, just continues to stick with me um, we had to learn all of the marsh plants. We had to learn about all the different aquatic invertebrates, the, the little flies and, and dragonflies that you would see. And the last test that we had was a practicum where we had to go and identify all these different numbered objects that were found in the marsh. And what was really interesting about that was there was a little island in the middle of the marsh and a number of the questions were on that island. And the only way to get to those questions was actually wading through the water. So I will say that is the only time in all of the classes I've ever taken where I had to take my shoes off and, and then actually wade through the water in order to answer the test questions. Um, so that was, that was definitely a memorable UCI experience. Um, I'm sure everyone else in my class also shares that memory with me. But um, now when I go back to UCI, it's, it's really incredible seeing the, the growth that the campus has had. Um, the student center doesn't look like what I remember. I remember a little, little Del Taco. Um, and, 
And so it's really, it's really great that the school has grown, that I've been able to be local and, and still see that and still visit the school. Um, I went back to the UCI extension program. I got a um, business administration certificate there. And so I continued to be involved in the UCI community. Um, the story behind the zoo and our anteater heritage here at the zoo, um, the zoo a little bit, if you've never been to the zoo, we're a small community zoo. We're run by the city of Santa Ana and we are right next to the five freeway, um, five miles from Disneyland and 20 acres. So we're not very big at all. Um, and the zoo opened in 1952 with a unique stipulation from a, a gentleman named Joseph Edward Prentice. And he had this unique stipulation that the park have 50 monkeys at all times. Um, he was a fan of monkeys and wanted to gift this property to the city. And, and he did that and, and that's where the zoo began with, with the story of the 50 monkeys. Um, over the decades, is that was, that was a long time ago, um, over the decades, the zoo evolved and became a more professional institution. And they, they developed something called the master plan for the, for the facility. And one of the first master plans for the zoo, which was originally developed in 1989, had the zoo specialize in South American and Central American creatures um, and wildlife from that region and the plants from that region. And part of the reason for that was because there are so many species of monkeys from Central and South America. Um, definitely throughout that whole range, there's many, many species. And the zoo at that time had, had lots of species of, of primates, um, spider monkeys and capuchins and lots of little tamarins, many of them with really important conservation stories that need to be shared, um, like the golden lion tamarins. And, so part, one of the unique creatures that is from South America and Central America is, of course, the giant anteater. So that's when the anteater first appeared in the zoo's master plan. Um, secondary to that, and, and uh, that's an equally interesting um, thing, is that UCI also happened to develop the, to vote and choose the anteater as the mascot for the school. So um, completely unrelated things but um, a great synergy that was able to uh, really be realized in 2009, 2010, when the anteater habitat was built at the zoo. Uh, the, the zoo is, was, um, had a goal of having different biomes where we would have a grasslands biome and a forest biome and a farm area and a wetlands biome. And at that time, we were wanting to develop a, the grasslands biome, the Tierra de las Pampas. And the anteaters are a species that really, really do live in the grasslands, among other habitats. Um, so that was a, there was a key opportunity to work with UCI, um, to bring the anteaters to, to our community. Um, I'm not aware of any giant anteaters living in Orange County prior to either coming here in 2009. Um, and, and I think definitely for, for the 250,000 visitors that come to the zoo every year, this is a great opportunity for them to see um, a very unique animal and then also learn a little bit more about the UCI story. Um, one, of the, one of the things there's also staff wise, there's uh, anteater heritage at the zoo because my predecessor, um, the, the past zoo director, um, and also the person that first hired me at the zoo, he was a UCI alumni as well in the biology department. Um, and he had a, had definitely had a fa fascination with anteaters and would lovingly refer to them as the most majestic creatures. Uh, one of the things I inherited, which is kind of interesting, is um, I, he did leave me a few tokens and that was part of his large anteater collection. So I will show off a few of our, our lovely anteaters. Um, and people would also send in anteater things, arts and crafts. And so there were, there were many stuffed anteaters. And, and these are just a few because Kent um, definitely did keep many of them. This is one of my favorites. It's a UCI basketball bobblehead, something not everybody has. 
um, anteater USB stick. <laughs> and, and this is a really great one, and I know you will all be jealous of this, a toy anteater from the littlest pet shop. <laughs> um, we also had an anteater vacuum, a toy vacuum, but I can't find that anywhere. Um, and then there's also some really nice artwork that we maintain at the zoo, um, anteater artwork. So just as UCI has an anteater collection, I'm sure, and memorabilia, we do too at the zoo. Um, we definitely cherish our anteaters and, and then um, try to share them with the community. On a personal note, I'll also add that uh, my family has a close connection to UCI because um, two of my older siblings went to UCI, one with a biology degree, um, one with a social ecology degree. Uh, my dad helps out with um, coaching the, uh, um, the, soccer, the soccer team. And uh, we've definitely been involved in UCI for a long time, um, have many friends that have been involved with the school as teachers, professors, um, and, and students. So uh, definitely lots of, of cherished memories of UCI. Um, I'm just gonna take a look at our schedule real fast. Um, I wanna touch on a couple other things. Um, this is not where I expected to be a few months ago. I didn't expect to be interacting with the community virtually with a mask on. It's a beautiful cat mask, if you can see. Um, um, some people thought it was an elephant. Um, I couldn't find an anteater mask. But we've definitely had to pivot over the last few months. The, all the staff at the zoo have done an amazing job of, of just reacting to the situation around us and, and modifying how they go about their days. We've had to modify um, all the operations at the zoo while we've been closed um, since, since mid-March. Uh, the animals, uh, we definitely take precautions around many of the species of animals, well, all the species of animals, but some of them that are based on, on the studies that we've seen so far, the tentative studies that are possibly more susceptible to COVID. So we are very careful um, wearing masks and using personal protective equipment where we need to. Um, around the animals, around the staff. Um, and now we're moving into an, the next phase, which is starting to look at how we can safely invite the public back into our facility. Um, fortunately, we are an outdoor facility, which makes it a little bit easier, um, but there are many modifications we need to make um, and we're not quite ready to open yet. I know some zoos and museums have already started to open in California and we're, we're have a, we have, a target in mind, but we're not quite there yet. So we're taking our time and um, we're definitely excited that we'll be able to, to bring people back and again, share our mission, um, mission for our organization with the community. Um, in the meantime, while we've been closed, we have tried to connect with, our, with the community. Um, a very novel, a novel thing that we did with the Santa Ana Unified School District. We did virtual programs um, our education department, they, they acted very quickly. And um, that was great that we were able to connect with the students when they weren't able to come to the zoo. And hopefully um, we can continue to still virtually interact with students in the community because there's many people for various reasons that can't come to the zoo or can't come to the zoo as often as they would like. So uh, it's a great way to share the animals um, and the zoo's mission with, with uh, everyone um, from, from the convenience of your home uh, or your office or your school. Um, we have been trying to um, raise some money um, to help support the zoo. So we do have some donation spots on our website. Um, we're looking at a virtual auction in August um, and everything goes back to support, the, support what we do caring for these animals. Uh, the animals have been a little bit different through this situation as well. Uh, they, there are animals that have for sure noticed the difference. There are no visitors here. I will say there's pretty, there's very few animals that have not noticed something is, is awry. Uh, 
some of the animals enjoy, seem to enjoy it or don't care. And there's some other animals like our capuchin monkeys and the goats in our farm area that really um, do seem to miss interacting with the visitors. I think as much as people um, come to the zoo and, and observe and learn from the animals, uh, the animals are also watching us too. Um, and and the, there's one capuchin monkey in particular, Mateo, that um, really likes to interact with people. Um, he likes that engagement. So we've been making sure to give him uh, a lot of extra attention during this period. Um, and the zookeepers have been coming up with all sorts of novel, novel ideas um, to keep him really engaged in thinking. Uh, and hopefully his public will be able to return soon <laughs> because he does miss them. The goats too. Oh, we've been doing some construction projects, some minor construction projects near the goats. So that has been keeping them pretty engaged. But if you walk by the goats, they will start making noise and you definitely have to visit them. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about, um, that's a little bit about what the zoo is doing right now with the COVID situation and how the animals are, in, um, how the animals are acting. Also say that we do a number of research projects at the zoo. And there's one that is just about ready to start um, that we've been, been really anticipating for a number of years now. And that is a conservation project with um, a local species called the mountain yellow-legged frog. And the mountain yellow-legged frog is native to the San Jacinto, the San Gabriel, and the San Bernardino mountain ranges, which which aren't too far from us, an hour and a half drive maybe. And um, back in the 70s, they were, they were pretty widespread in the upper elevation streams that are, that are cold water. Um, but since that time period, their population has continued to, to drastically decline. And right now there's an estimate of maybe 200 to 300 adults left in the wild. We have a partnership with a government agency, the US Geological Survey. They have offices here at the zoo and they go out and for the last 15 years, they've been researching um, the species and taking water quality measurements, studying them, counting the animals, um, and, and just monitoring how they're doing. And in that period, a conservation project was set up um, to captive, captive rear these frogs and reintroduce them into suitable habitat in these mountain ranges. Uh, one issue, for the, for the amphibians um, is invasive species. So um, invasive trout, like the brown trout, get into these streams and they eat the tadpoles, they eat the young frogs. So you have to do eradication efforts um, until you reach a point where there's a physical barrier where the fish can't get through. And then now you have a clean area where you can reintroduce animals. So they've been working with lots of different partners um, to, to set up suitable habitat for the animals to go back into. And we are just coming online now with a frog lab. We're calling it the amphibian pod. This is actually a 20, 25 foot shipping container, a refrigerated shipping container that's been repurposed as an amphibian lab. And we're hopeful, um, hopefully in July, we'll be receiving some tadpoles from the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, because the Los Angeles Zoo and the San Diego zoos have been raising tadpoles for a number of years now. And now we're, we're joining this program and hopefully a few other institutions will be too. So that's one research conservation project that we're very excited about. Um, and it is just, just around the corner now. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long time coming. Some, some other things that we've been working on, we, we work with researchers um, from, from different universities We've worked with UCI students before. We've worked with um, graduate students. Um, we have a program right now that we're just about to start over the summer with a graduate student from UCLA um, that's gonna be studying the capuchin monkeys and observing how they use tools. Uh, we have a species here that's endangered in Brazil, the crested capuchin, and she's gonna be taking lots of video and giving them different items to manipulate and studying them and as part of her graduate program. Uh, we also are working on collecting um, fecal samples from the animals because there's a lot of um, endocrinology information, endocrinological information that uh, we, can, we can learn from the animals. So 
a metric that some zoos use and study um, is um, cortisol levels in their in the animals um, fecal samples so we've been collecting those and we're going to try and learn um, if there's if that's an indicator of animals stress level and their welfare and we're trying to learn how that uh, may be changing while the zoo is closed versus when the visitors are here and we do have a pretty comprehensive welfare program where we look at all the animals and do analyze things and try to make um, improvements. So hopefully this can layer into what we're already doing and um, learn more about the animals in this way and share that with other, other facilities, other zoos. Um, I think that uh, about brings us to our next spot. Um, and I have a little uh, a video that we're going to play and then we'll go into another trivia question. And I think Jeff is going to queue up the video. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to this video. It was, it's called The Great Big Story. Pole what? Pole first. Pole first. Okay, I am backwards. <laughs> Jeff, are you with us? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, first, we have uh, this trivia question. Uh, we're going to ask uh, a little bit of these uh, as we go along, but uh, the question is, what is a popular treat given to anteaters? And uh, you're going to have about 10, 15 seconds to respond to that. We've got Nutella. That's a popular treat I like. Ooh, no that's a popular cream. treat for Ethan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Plain yogurt and peanut butter. <laughs> Just a few more seconds. We need to uh, repurpose this. <laughs> Nutella with vanilla ice cream would be my choice. Okay. I know one of your other speakers was from the Black Market Bakery. Um, Correct. That is a favorite treat. <laughs> so, Ethan, the results are 61% of our audience picked peanut butter. And oh, uh, no. what is the correct answer, Ethan? The correct answer is um, glorious vanilla yogurt. <laughs> so, we we'll actually... love their yogurt. They do love their yogurt. And earlier, before we started the video, we were sort of joking around that we um, need to do a taste test with the anteaters and see if they prefer plain yogurt, strawberry flavored, Greek yogurt, Icelandic yogurt. There's so many options, and we really haven't explored that. Um, so something <laughs> for the future. <laughs> All right, so now we do have a, a short video called On the Brink that we're gonna queue up uh, Cameron, one of our Wonderful student assistants. Go ahead and cue that up, please. And Ethan, that was the great big story video. Can you tell us oh a little gosh, bit look about at that? Peter. <laughs> okay, um, I just have to show you something really cute right now because Peter is rolling around on the ground behind us. You can just rotate it, Lauren. Oh, no, he stopped. Oh, no, he stopped. Okay, um, so where I'm standing, you have bamboo behind me. Um, but I am opposite of the anteaters and we have been standing this whole time and I actually have to Acknowledge and thank Lauren our education specialist who is helping me through this whole process um, With the camera and all the tech um, Usually she's the one standing here doing this and I'm behind the camera um, but The great big story they came to us and that was that's uh, something they're still continuing to do where they have these short video clips uh, of interesting stories. Uh, there was a series where they tried to do, um, cover lots of different animals. Um, and they were going to different zoos and aquariums um, and working with those, those um, organizations to film clips of their animals. And they, they were interested in filming the anteaters. We had Peter here. Um, so all of that video was filmed here at the zoo. They set up a big paper backdrop in the animal's habitat um, and we lured him on there with yogurt. You may have seen the little drops of yogurt. Um, so that was filmed here. That was Peter. There's a similar, there's a similar thing um, that was done with National Geographic and a photographer, Joel Satori, where he has gone the photo arc project and he's gone around to conservation facilities throughout the world, to zoos, to aquariums, to um, nature centers and photograph species um, usually against a white backdrop and just tries to tell their story. Um, so this is very similar to that. And we were happy to be involved um, in these types of um, projects whenever we can, these initiatives. 
Um, so we're gonna talk about anteaters now. Um, and I will briefly talk about bringing the anteaters to the zoo. Then we'll talk about the natural history of anteaters. And then we'll take a look at our anteaters and a special guest. Um, so the anteaters came here in 2009 when we were building the anteater habitat. Um, we, they were, that was the first time we had anteaters at the zoo. Um, there were two anteaters that were the first animals that moved into the zoo, um, Peter, and the, we have a female anteater named Hisu of Troy. Um, at that time, Hisu of Troy was, she was also sponsored, um, and the sponsor was a USC graduate. So there was a little bit of competition there. So that's, um, that's that. Uh, she, she has had a number of offspring at the zoo since they've been here over the last decade. Um, and some of them have gone to other, well, all of them have gone to other zoos, except the one that we currently have. Um, so one is living at the Dallas Zoo, one is living at Fresno, another's at San Antonio. Um, so they're, they're out there um, throughout the United States. And all of the anteaters are part of uh, something called a species survival program. There is a volunteer that coordinates the anteater um, program in the US and that person keeps track of all of the records of where the anteaters are, um, how they're related, um, what needs different zoos have. Um, is zoo XYZ going to be building an anteater habitat? Are they going to be doing construction and they need to um, reduce the number of anteaters they have? And so they keep track of all of that. And then they work with a population biologist um, every year or two to develop a whole written program um, and plan as to how they can maintain the genetic diversity in the, the population in the United States. Um, and then also um, what, what uh, conservation projects and research projects as a whole the community can be involved in. Um, because we have a pool of about 150 anteaters living in North America. And that is, that's an opportunity to learn a lot about the species that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so that's how we, that's how we work with the anteaters. Um, that's, that's a little bit about how they're managed here at the zoo. They're solitary animals, so we don't usually have them all together. Um, in the wild, they only come together for mating. Um, and if you see more than one anteater together in the wild, um, you would have, it would be a mother and her offspring. Um, and the offspring will stay with the parent for a year to two years, potentially. Uh, a unique thing for anteaters is that the offspring ride on the mom's back, like a little backpack. And I have some photos. So you can see here's a baby anteater um, riding on mom's back. Um, the anteater, it does have a long tongue too, even when it's little. Um, and the tongue has lots of, lots of texture to it. Um, and this is how one of our anteater eats. She can be sometimes a little bit, a little bit um, relaxed when she eats her food. So she doesn't even get up sometimes. Um, what does an anteater eat here at the zoo? Well, in the wild, they eat termites, they eat ants, they eat other soft bodied insects because they have no teeth. Um, they were formerly called edentates. So toothless animals um, like, like a, other animals that were sort of like that were um, sloths and armadillos, but sloths and armadillos actually do have teeth. Um, so now people just generally call them xenarthrins. So that's the category, um, the scientific category with anteaters, sloths, and armadillos. Um, so without having any teeth, I have a little box of tricks here. Um, the anteaters would eat many, many ants. Um, this jar contains about 30, um, 1,000 ants, and an anteater is estimated to eat about 30,000 ants in a day. So imagine 30 of these jars is uh, a good meal, a good daily uh, ratio for an anteater. Um, like I said, they don't have any teeth, so 
something they they do have a lot of texture on their tongue so they would sort of be like going into the termite mound and all the ants would stick onto their tongue um, and they they don't have too much time when they go to a termite mound or an ant hill because um, they definitely come out to protect themselves and um, soldier ants are not not friendly to the anteaters um, and they also don't want to do too much damage to these um, these insect colonies because they they can come back and feed on them again the way they get into the termite mound or the ant hill um, are with their sharp claws and their very strong forearms um, and they they sort of walk on their knuckles um, if you looked at your hand and you're holding it it would be sort of like you're walking like this on the fleshy part of your hand uh, and that protects their very large claws so this is a replica of an anteater claw this way oh now you can see it so this is a replica of an anteater claw you can see it's quite large um, it would do a lot of damage to a termite mound or an anthill um, and that is really important for them you can also see they have a very elongated um, skull um, and their tongue, which everybody knows about the famous anteater tongue, um, can come out pretty, it can come out pretty far out of the anteater's mouth. So the tongue goes out, goes into the termite mound, and they're pretty effective feeders. Their eyes are set all the way back in their, on their skull and their ears, so they're far away from their mouth, um, so they're not getting exposed right at the, the front line of the, the anthill. Um, and then the anteater diet at the zoo, um, we give them a special pellet. It comes in, a, comes in a, um, a sack like dog food and it's formulated for insect eating animals. So we formulate, we mix that with papaya, um, with spinach, hard boiled egg and water and we blend it up into the slurry, and that is that is anteaters' breakfast and dinner. Um, and I think, let's see, should we um, show them? We're going to turn the camera around and show you the anteaters now. Um, and then after that, I'll show you our, our briefly show you our other special guest. So Lauren is walking over there to show you the anteaters, and then. Let me move this way. So on the left hand side, you'll see Peter. That is Peter the anteater. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have um, Hisu and then her, her young offspring, um, who we're referring to as um, Pumpkin. And he was born in November. Um, so he was quite small when he was born. They're only about um, one and a half kilograms, so about three, three to four pounds. And, and then um, now that he has been more adventurous with the better weather, March through, through now, um, people haven't really seen him yet. Um, but he, is, he spends a lot of time exploring with his mom. Uh, you can see that his hair is fanned out on his, on his back and on his tail. The anteaters have tails that are almost as long as their body, very clear. Um, they'll typically sleep in a shallow depression or in the plants, and then they'll fold their tail over the top of their body. Um, and once that happens, you really can't see them because they just, they just disappear into the, into the environment. Um, everyone's coming to visit right now. <laughs> So we do have some yogurt. I'm not going to get too close to them because we do are trying to maintain social distance with some of the animals. Um, but I do have some yogurt, so I'm going to present them with the yogurt cup here. And let's see what he does. So let's see. I'm going to hold this back here. Yeah. 
I think Peter will want yogurt. So let's give him some. We definitely want to share. Peter. He'll come back. And one of the things you'll notice in the anteater habitat is this large concrete termite mound. Um, we work with many volunteers um, in the community to, to help the zoo. And this was an Eagle Scout project that, um, that someone did. It's an enrichment feeder. So there's ports on it where the zookeepers can put the anteater food and the anteaters have to sort of feed out of those, of those narrow tubes. Um, and it's, it's an interesting way to see them, to see them feed and um, they seem to like it. Peter, come over here. There you are. Oh, now he's found it. He got it. You can see Peter using his tongue, eating the yogurt. Um, this is one of his favorite treats. Um, another feature in their habitat. Looks like we've lost audio, Ethan, if you oh. can hear me. Oh, there I can you go. Hear. We've got, oh. we've, we've got you back, back now? now, Ethan. Okay, yeah. very good. So I was talking about the anteaters have a pond in their habitat um, that, they, uh, that they use to cool off in the summertime when it's hot and to bathe. Anteaters can swim. Um, so if you come to the zoo, you'll find the anteaters in our grasslands area. And um, there are some companion animals that live near them. We have a family of guanacos, which are like llamas. Um, they, they're um, in the camel family, um, and they, they live here near the anteaters. Also large flightless birds called rias, which are like South American ostriches. Um, another animal you would find in the pompous grasslands of South America, um, where you would find the anteaters. And like I said before, uh, Anteaters are xenarthrins, and that is a unique type of animal. Uh, let's see. And of the xenarthrins, there are, there are sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. Um, historically, going back a long, long time, there were, there were um, ground sloths in North America, there are different types of armadillos, um, and in all of these, this whole, all these types of animals are found in the Americas. So, North America, Central America, South America. Uh, the only one that is still still persists in North America this to this day is the the nine-banded armadillo you would find in Florida and Texas. But there are are many species of armadillos that still live in. South America and Central America. And I have a cousin to Peter the anteater. And this is Bolito, our three-banded armadillo. Um, three-banded armadillos also come from a similar habitat or the same habitat as some giant anteaters uh, because they will live in the Chaco or the grasslands in South America. Uh, so, and, and sort of eat a similar diet they, they eat insects, and they also eat plant material, so shoots and flowers, um, grubs. Um, and, and Bolito is an animal that we take out uh, for education programs at the zoo. He is an animal ambassador. We do many, many education programs for the community, both at the zoo and for students uh, for sc in schools. We go into schools. Um, we have field trips where the students come here and uh, we, we introduced them to some of these animals. So this is, this is Bolito. Uh, he's a, called a three-banded armadillo because you see these three bands on his back here. Uh, he also is able to roll up almost entirely into a ball. Uh, he is active throughout the day and then also at night. Uh, 
and he has this sort of protective helmet um, on his head. And and Ethan, I don't know if you can hear me, but fun fact: Bolito has been to UCI. Uh, your has... predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ken, and we've only Ken's... ever had one, so this is this is him in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, your predecessor, Kent Yamaguchi, brought him to the Newkirk Alumni Center for an educational program. He couldn't bring Peter the Anteater, but he brought Polito, and okay. uh, we had a lot of uh, students who were interested. <laughs> yep, so he's still with us. They they can live about 30 years, um, and he is, I think he's about, what, six or seven? Yeah, so I'm going to put Polito back because I think we're probably at the time for question and answer. That's right. That's right. I'll, uh, I'll transition us to Q&A. And okay. Ethan, uh, before we do that, wonderful tour. And thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, as you know, as everyone here knows, I believe, um, our UCI alumni and students are very proud of our mascot. Uh, founded in 1965, we started right away with the mascot after the, the vote with the water polo team and uh, everyone who made the anteater a reality. And we're so lucky to have the Santa Ana Zoo as a phenomenal local resource in Orange County and the home to the Peter the Anteater. Uh, the Anteater featured in that great big story video we showed earlier, just to be clear, was Peter. That is the Peter we just saw Ethan feed yogurt to. Um, so we're all eagerly awaiting the reopening of the zoo where we can come see Peter and Hisu uh, in person and um, you know continue the Anteater population there at the zoo. We, of course, have tons of anteater memorabilia on campus at the New Kirk Alumni Center, uh, at the Hill, the Satchel at the Bren, et cetera. And uh, we have a 25 million year history of the giant anteater, as we learned in that video. Uh, we have a 55 year history with Peter the anteater. Uh, and we have a, a more recent history, winning all of the college mascot contests. I had to point that out. If you look behind me, uh, Tokyo Dashi ran a contest just a couple of weeks ago, uh, 256 college mascots and Peter won. Uh, it's a, probably the fourth mascot contest that we've won in the last five years because it's so unique and well loved. So I had to sneak in those points. We do have some great questions. Uh, we're only gonna have time for about uh, five, six minutes of questions, Ethan. So okay. I'm gonna start with, um, a couple of quick ones. Do you know what the lifespan of anteaters in the wild is? And that comes from Catherine Williams. I'm not sure of the exact lifespan in the wild. Um, I know there are a number of studies going on with wild anteaters. I'm not sure if there's anyone that is doing um, radio tracking or ongoing surveillance where they'd be able to determine that. Um, a big issue with anteaters in the wild um, is habitat fragmentation and road roads uh, where anteaters have uh, uh, interactions with vehicles that are not not great for them. Um, so that's ah. that's an issue that wild anteaters are having, and I don't know their exact lifespan. Um, in zoos, anteater lifespans tend to be in the early 20s. Um, you might have a 20 to a 24 year old anteater as an old anteater. There. Got it. Okay. How large is the square footage of each anteater enclosure? And that comes from Steve Ackerman. I don't have the exact square footage. Um, I can definitely get that if you want to include that later on. Um, okay. I will say that the anteaters uh, are, have a habitat that's on the larger side as far as um, zoo anteater habitats that I've seen. Oh, wonderful. Um, Back to the uh, the formation of the zoo, Steve Taylor asks, do you still have 50 primates today? And what is your, numerous, your, your most numerous primate species that you have? We do, we do still um, have many, many primates at the zoo. Uh, we're, we're moving on to the next phase of development in the future, where we're going to be redeveloping the north end of the zoo, which is where the original primate habitats were um, built and some of them we still have. Uh, we're going to be redeveloping that as a primate forest um, in the future. Mm. We always want to honor the primate heritage of the zoo and the zoo's founding, but we're moving more towards um, the quality of the animal spaces and what we can provide for the animals over the specific number. 
Um, so that, that is coming. We're starting to plan that now. We're very excited. The species that we have the most of, we have the most tamarins. Uh, right now, golden-headed lion tamarins, which are a critically endangered species from South America, from Brazil. Um, there's four different types, uh, I believe it's four, species of lion tamarins um, that live in Brazil in very small ranges. And we have two, we have the golden lion tamarin and the golden-headed lion tamarin. And I think we have about 12 right now. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Ethan. Now we've got a lot of questions about this uh, from Gary Banfield, Christina Zabitfran, and Alberto Sandoval. They all want to know how old each of the anteaters you have are. Peter, Husu, okay. and Pumpkin. We don't, um, so Pumpkin was born in November, and Peter and Hisu are both about 15, 16 years old. Okay. And uh, shout out to Emma Sandoval as well for wanting to know that question. Uh, Ethan, do <laughs> Julie Lance, uh, one of one of our great colleagues, would like to know: Do anteaters make good pets? Oh no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I wouldn't recommend an anteater as a pet. Um, not only are they not legal as a pet in California, uh, they have a very unique musk to them, so you can smell when you're near the anteaters. They're not potty trained, so they tend to they tend to defecate in their pond every day and then bathe in it. Um, so there's that, um, and they have those huge claws. They rip everything up. So I definitely wouldn't encourage any um, exotic animals as pets, and especially not an anteater. But historically, many exotic animals did come to the United States and were pets back in the the 60s and, and earlier. And there's a, a famous picture of Salvador Dali where he is yes. walking out of the subway station in New York City with his anteater um, on a leash. Uh, he also had an ocelot. So I don't <laughs> recommend that. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Kelly and Kyle Lance. Uh, no anteater pets for you. Um, We're going to turn around the camera just... because they're being very cute. <laughs> Oh, all right. Yeah, we'll watch them. We've got we've got time for just two more questions. Okay. Goran Goran Matyasevich would like to know: Are Peter and Hisu of Troy uh, ever together? And does Peter get time with Pumpkin? Um, so they are they are not they. Peter and Hisu are together um, when they are without an offspring. Um, when when Hisu is with a baby or a young one, we do keep them separate. Uh, which is, uh, which is uh, for sort of their natural history. They're solitary animals. And there are some zoos that have had issues when they kept the male with the, with the mother. So um, that is why we do manage them separate. Um, and then when, when Pumpkin moves off to another zoo in the future, and that is natural, eventually when he's about a year and a half, two years old, Oh, we lost your signal there, Ethan. Let's see if you if you come back. I believe you all in the audience can still hear me, so we'll wait. Uh, Ethan, can you hear me again? We've got your video feed. Okay, so I will. Uh, I'll begin to wrap us up as we do get the video feed. We can't hear Ethan at this point, but if he does chime in, we'll uh, we'll go back to him. Uh, there are a few things that I wanted to say uh, before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for attending and thanks everyone for the great questions. This was a phenomenal turnout. Uh, we did record this session, so I encourage you, uh, we will send out that recording link. You can watch the video and I encourage you to forward it on to your anteater friends who may be interested or those uh, others who may be interested in attending uh, the Santa Ana Zoo. Um, we do have some upcoming events and uh, our next Lunch with Eaters is going to be on Friday, July 10th from 12 to 1, featuring Hector Tobar, who's an alumnus and professor for, the creative, for a creative writing workshop. Um, if you want to reach out to us with any follow-up questions that perhaps we can uh, forward on to Ethan or the zoo, email alumni at uci.edu. And um, before we wrap, Ethan, uh, do we have your audio feedback? Can, can, you hear uh, me? can you hear me now? 
Yeah, we have you, Ethan. We have we have changed the microphone. Uh, okay, we've got you now. Our battery, our battery didn't quite make it. Um, so yeah, I can't recall what question we were on right there. The question was about how much time do the anteaters get to spend oh, right. together? Yeah, so we do keep them separated when um, when when Hisu is has a offspring uh, because there are some that have had negative interactions with the adult male, um, and in the wild they wouldn't they wouldn't be. Okay, so uh, we've lost the feed again. Um, that's okay because we are at time. Uh, we did plan to go to the clock. Um, we do have a recording of this session, and um, and Ethan, if you can hear us, thank you so much for answering all of those questions um, and taking the time to to give us a, a, a personal tour of the anteater habitats. And uh, that you know, I think we all learned a lot, despite all being anteater experts, is ready uh, already. Um, so we have a final poll, a very quick poll that we want to pop up. Cameron, if you can pop up that poll before we wrap the event. This poll is just a, a question about um, helping us continue to improve our Lunch with Eaters series. So just please let us know what your level of satisfaction is and we can adjust appropriately. As I said, our next event will be on Friday, July 10th from 12 to 1. And uh, keep an eye out because we have a number of other virtual programs and events going on between now and then. So thank you for answering that question. Uh, one more time, uh, huge thanks to Ethan Fisher and me, the Santa Ana Zoo. Um, this was a, a great program. We hope you will share the recording. We hope you will join us again in the future for Lunch with Eaters events. And uh, I appreciate everyone's questions. And um, let's go see Peter the Anteater once the zoo reopens again. And uh, perhaps we will do an in-person event there for our UCI alumni. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you, everyone. And we'll give one last anteater, zot, zot, zot. Take care, everybody.